an introduction to GBI, Grace Bible Institute, a place for information, transformation, and impartation. When you choose Grace Bible Institute, you have chosen biblical information, transformation, and impartation for a meaningful Christian walk, worthy of the calling with which you are called. Our primary goal at GBI is to convey foundational Bible truth to ordinary saints, such truth which is hidden in theological seminaries far away beyond that which many well-meaning believers could ever afford. Enroll with us and find the content and the confidence with which you can defend and confirm the truth in love. You are welcome. Karibuni sana to the afternoon uh, session. The first thing we looked at is that the message or the facts concerning the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, they are historical, they are, uh, they are credible, they are truth, and they are verifiable. And then we said, one, it fulfills the Old Testament scriptures, then two, you can verify it doctrinally, and three, we have three here that the Father, God the Father himself gives testimony of these things. The Father's testimony, God the Father on several occasions testified publicly and audibly that Christ Jesus was his own son. Okay, we have heavenly witness, we have earthly witness, and uh, that's why these things are verifiable. You can prove, you can prove that what you are learning is true. Uh, the father testified like this that when he had been baptized Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well placed I love this scripture because for the first time on earth this manifestation of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The entire trinity of God is made manifest the first time when Christ is revealed to the world. At the, at the, at the revelation of Christ Jesus, the Father was there and the Holy Spirit was there to say, yes, he's the one. The testimony by the Father, while he was still speaking, behold, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased to hear him this was also during the transfiguration after Christ had been transfigured and Peter mistook that Jesus Christ and, and, uh, and um, uh, Moses and Elijah were the same cadre, same category of people and God said no, 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 no this one is different I wanted to hear him alone so the apostles therefore declared that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This is enough reason to, as to why every well-meaning believer should preach the gospel without shame or fear. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. First the Jews and next, uh, last the Gentiles. And that's why all of us should never be ashamed of the gospel. This man was standing here in a red t-shirt. He told me one day he was in a matatu and he asked himself, do all these people know the truth? Then he just stood up in a matatu and began to preach. So he preached and he was shaking inside, what am I doing? But there was some power in him just preaching in a matatu and preaching in a matatu. Then he alighted and he wanted to go away because he felt like maybe he has done something wrong. And he said some people followed him and told him, stop. And they told him, we've never heard what you have been talking in a matatu. Where do you go to church? Where blah, blah, blah. So they wanted to know much about him. So later, so he, he was in the, in the same matatu, but he didn't speak because the voice had gone. So after he alighted, someone asked him, what about Vanyaji? They were waiting for him to, to preach. You know, in a matatu, whenever I sat with someone in a matatu, I'll, I'll preach to him or her. So this day, I, I, I looked for a way, I looked for a way, I, I, I knocked her. You know, 
She looked at me. I said, I'm sorry. But then the, the discussion started from there. I was talking about Jesus. I started talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She was just looking at me. Then suddenly, she stood up and made noise, shaking herself, saying, Stop! Stop! I was terrified. I just thought, but I told her, whether you like it or not, Jesus loves you. He died for you on the cross. He paid for your sins. I started preaching now to the whole matter now for the first time. Because she was shouting, I said, now let me tell the, everybody what I was telling her. It was the most interesting time. So I just, I started preaching there loudly, 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 loudly. I preached loudly. When I came out of the Matatu, I walked very fast away. I didn't want another person to see me. I was around the Kenya cinema in town. Another girl came. She says, I was so blessed with what you talked to the Matatu. I said, Ata wo luko huko. Yeah. <laughs> so we went and sat down and I had a cup of tea. I clarified a few things as she was asking. Then she took my number. I took her number. And then sometimes my, my, uh, later my sister, my young sister fell sick. She was living in Kitale. So I went and stayed in Kitale for about one week. So I could walk in town just praying, saying, God, just heal. Then I stumbled with that lady. Papa. She says, this weekend we have a minister in our church. Then she organized everything in Kimilili. And it was packed to the brim. And now I was ministering there. Where was, did the connection come from? I'm a tattoo. And I've had many opportunities just because I was somewhere and I opened up the gospel. So take every opportunity that God gives you. I still do that. Every time God gives me an opportunity, I never, ever slumber on it. I preach the gospel. When you get an opportunity, don't stop. Don't start arguing with him. Deliverance is a nini. deliverance. You will actually deliver him. We experience this every day, every day where you go. Whenever God gives you an opportunity, even to get him or Wili, Wengi, preach the gospel. Amen? It's practical. It's very real. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish um, the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we, and we, <laughs> we preach, Christ crucified, to the Jew a stumbling block, to the, Je the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. How can you be ashamed of something like that? The power of God and the wisdom of God. Preach Christ. Preach Christ. I can give you testimonies and testimonies. The gospel is the power of God. And once you are speaking the truth, Nobody, nobody can interfere with you. Nobody. Nobody. I don't know if theology, I'm a PhD. If you speak the gospel, it equalizes everybody. That's why this is a message you can speak in Korokocho and in the State House. And it will be received. Don't be ashamed of it. We in the Bible, we have a future, in Christo. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. Are you seeing? Power, the Holy Spirit, much assurance. The gospel brings rest. It brings that assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you, for you are sick, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Now look at that. They received the word. They were going through much affliction. 
by the head the joy of the Holy Spirit. Look at what the gospel does. Don't be ashamed of it. Never be ashamed of it. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. It's the power of God. It effectively works in everyone who believes. That's the gospel we preach. Amen? Most believers, they don't know that the gospel is working in their lives. And you know why? You, all of you who are, who are parents, have you ever looked at your child and said, look at how he's growing. You see the child moving like this. You just notice the child has grown. You see? If you meet your auntie who went to the U.S. even right now, because your auntie remembers that you are a child. <laughs> they don't know you have grown up. They don't know. They don't know if you have grown up. Because growth sometimes is, is very hard to measure. Growth is only measured when you see the actions. You see? Actions. So most believers, they want the spectacular. And the gospel is producing gradual, progressive growth and impact in your life. And you don't want to see it. You are looking for the spectacular. You are looking for fire from heaven. You know? And the gospel is producing things in your life. Things that are tangible. You can remember, I never used to have the guts to stand before people. Now I stand before people even just to say, Buana Mungu as if you. You know? You know, you, the way you confuse a few words here, you know. But you are standing before people. Say, kuna kakitabu kikina in the soma, kakitabu ya Abraham. Kakitabu na nisaidi yanga sana. But at least you are standing before people now. You are growing. You are growing. Gospel produces results in you. You find that you never used to pray, now you are able to pray. You never used to read the Bible, now you are able to read the Bible. There are things you could not do. You discover that, eh, what happened to me? I used to have to last for so much food. <laughs> but <in the> pumuza. <laughs> you just discover that the gospel has worked inside you to produce results. If you look at who you are and who you are after listening to the gospel and believing the gospel, there is tremendous change, transformation in your life. Your appetites have changed. Your desires have changed. Your passions have changed. Your anxieties have changed. In you, there is a lot of change. But you don't know there's the gospel working through you. Because we don't know the gospel. The spectacular is good. But gradual and progressive transformation is the most important thing. Just believe the word of God. It will do it. Amen? It will do it. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you have heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively, effectively works in you who believe. Amen. We are, we are still looking at verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for everyone who believes. The message of the gospel should be presented to every individual member of the human race on planet Earth. Everyone who believes. We have the responsibility. You have the responsibility. I have the, the responsibility to make sure that everyone who encounters me in this life must hear the gospel. And this is what we said uh, sometimes back, I don't know if it was in church or in this class, that all of us must start creating unique platforms where on we can preach the gospel. We must start creating unique platforms. Once in a month, you can get a cup of tea and invite people in your house and tell them, hey, you are having tea in my house this time. Invite people in your house. Tell them, welcome to my house. Share with them. Create a platform for preaching the gospel. There are so many social programs that you can, you can, you can have. When people come, now you can be able to preach the gospel. You see, there are opportunities you can create to preach the gospel. Give it out. Amen. 
create opportunities tafuta chai tia watu family uh -huh. you can even learn about football just take your time to learn about football so that you call people to analyze football but before you analyze football let's say let's pray after praying 15 minutes share the gospel analyze football europe european league rafcon let them go do that do that do that do that anything you can use anything anything the trip we went to uganda there are doctors from the us they come they are treating people and people are desperately sick but before they treat people they put them in a room like this we preach to them you know the sick people they want god and they are attentive they are listening we preach to them after preaching to them you go and sit somewhere anybody who needs counseling you can't finish you can't finish so you have to do like 10 of them at, at a go 10 of them at a go talking to them praying with each and every one of them explaining some things to them people need to hear the gospel they need so those doctors created a platform and they said they are doing what is called uh, Massive Trips Africa. They said we can begin Massive Outreach Africa. You see what is happening. You have so much you can do. So much you can do. And don't be ashamed of it. Everyone. Everyone needs to hear the gospel from you. Not from another person. Make it your personal uh, responsibility. And, and how do you know that God wants everyone to hear the gospel? Look at the scripture. For God so loved what? The world. That gave his only begotten son. So God loves, loves the world. The world. And if God loves the world, then the servants of God must also love the world and give the gospel to them. Uh, when Jesus was commissioning his uh, uh, apostles, he told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. To the end of the earth. That was the commission that they should witness what Christ is doing all over, all over the whole world. In 1 Corinthians uh, 12 and verse 12, the Bible says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of the one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So you see, we are many. We are many. We don't have a shallow or a, a, a narrow mind when it comes to the gospel. Don't be narrow to just a few people where you are. The purpose of God in your life is beyond boundaries. Beyond boundaries. Amen? Beyond family boundaries, beyond church boundaries, beyond denominational boundaries, beyond national boundaries. You need to step up. Step up. And if you look at how Jesus had told them, you will be my witnesses first where? Jerusalem. Then Judea. Then Samaria. Then to the ends of the world. He, the expansion of the gospel must begin from where you are. Yeah? You don't begin by saying you'll be an evangelist in the U.S. and you have never preached to your wife even. The response to the gospel, the positive response to the gospel is an effortless act of believing in Jesus Christ and his finished work at the cross of Calvary. Why is it effortless? Because believing is not work. Believing is not work. Yeah? If you met Patrick Sunday here, he's sweating. Sweating. You ask him, what is it? Say, I've been reading the Bible, I'm trying to believe. Yeah? It's hard to believe. You know, believing is hard. So he's sweating because he's believing. Is that possible? Believing is effortless. You, you don't need any efforts to believe. For one to believe, he needs to be convinced. To be persuaded. The facts are supposed to be presented. Then the person is convinced or persuaded. Then he believes. To be persuaded or convinced is not an effort. It's just a positive response to the gospel. Look at how Jesus explained to Nicodemus. I, I love this scripture so much. That's why I walk with it everywhere I go. Nicodemus was a ruler 
of the Jewish people. He was a rich man. Rich man. He's not a poor man. He had a name and influence. He had a name and influence. A teacher of uh, the law of Moses. And I believe Nicodemus was actually a busy man. That's why he came to Christ at night. I believe so. Yeah. I agree up knowing that Ali is feature feature because I'm Jewish. But after looking at the philosophy of the, what he used to do, I think he was just sincerely a busy guy. So after the office, he said, let me go and see this, this man here. If you read <laughs> John 3, there's something that you need to look at John 3. Jesus is comparing natural and spiritual things. When he tells him, you need to be born again. You get it? He's talking about a spiritual thing using a natural phenomena that's well understood. And throughout, he compares wind and the Holy Spirit. So in verse, I think in verse 9, after Nicodemus is arguing and arguing and asking stupid questions, he just asks him, hey Nicodemus, I thought you were the teacher of the law. You mean you don't understand what I'm telling you? He tells him, I've been talking to you about natural things and you don't grasp it. Don't get them. Now, how about if I talk to you spiritual things? You know, after the Lord has asked you those kind of questions, you don't talk again. Don't talk again. Actually, Nicodemus has said, Hey, 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 You don't see anyone. <laughs> you don't see anyone. He's saying, okay, Nicodemus has said, hey, 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 we never know when he left. Because I thought you were the teacher of the law. Teacher of the law. Give us the scripture. I thought you were the teacher of the law. How comes you don't understand these things? So Nicodemus and Olisa, but how can this be? Eh? How can this be? How can someone go back to his mother's womb and do what? So how can these things be? Then Jesus answered and said, Are you the teacher of Israel? And you not know these things. So when you live for Israel, let's be to Elewi. Then Jesus takes over from there. Now he's not allowing him to ask any question. He just wants to minister to him. He tells him most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know. And testify what we. You see that we? So who is this we with the capital? The Trinity of God. Eh? What we have seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I've told you about getting born. Where would you want to Zaliwa? You don't understand. I've talked to you about wind. You've never seen the work, the damage wind has done all over. You don't understand. Now I want to speak to you heavenly things. Then he picks up from there and says something that is very, very, very foundational. He takes him back to the Old Testament because Nicodemus is a Jew, is a teacher of the law. So what does Jesus do? He takes him back to the Old Testament and tells him, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Basics. Yeah. Takes him back to the basics in, in uh, Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Nicodemus is supposed to be knowing that there's a time that the entire uh, family of Israel grumbled, they quarreled against Moses. They complained against Moses. They said, this Moses has taken us from a good place in Egypt. He has brought us in the wilderness to suffer. We are suffering here. And they started disobeying him, not doing what Moses asked them to do. And God says, hey, it's easy. Let them die. So how do they die? God sent poisonous serpents to bite the people. And the people were faced with one uh, challenge, death. Everybody there was going to die because of being bitten by his necks. Nicodemus and Akumbuka Yovizoriza, he remembers. It's something, it's historical. It happened. Then, when they, they were dying and dying and dying, they ran to Moses again and said, Moses, please, talk to God that he may have mercy on us. So they appealed to God for mercy. 
you need to follow it. What was the problem they were having? All of them were facing death. Then they appealed to God for mercy. And God said, I'll show you my mercy. This is the way I'll show you my mercy. Moses go, make a bronze serpent, lift it up. When you hear bronze in the Bible, it talks about judgment. So lift it up. Then the bronze serpent is lifted up. Then an instruction is given that everyone who looks at the serpent will be healed. Everyone who looks at the serpent will be healed. So, Moses did that. If you looking at the serpent is also synonymous to believing. To believing also. So, look at the serpent. So, the instructions were so simple. Everyone who looks at that serpent. Now, try to think. If someone went with money and put at the, at, at the bottom of that uh, pole, will he get healed? What was the instructions? Look. If you went and said, me, I don't want to look, I just want to cry until God heals me, and you cried and rolled yourself on the ground, will you be healed? So it doesn't matter. If you went there and you say, I'll spend 40 days here fasting and praying, will you be healed? There was only one narrow get to healing. Look at the serpent. So, when the announcement is made, all you needed to do is hear, understand, believe, respond. Hear, understand, believe, respond. And the response was, look. Don't do anything else. Just look. So, Jesus tells Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What is coming in the mind of, of Nicodemus? Because this was the, the serpent was, sold, was judged on the pole to solve the issue of death. Now the son of man is here. He will also be lifted up. We, what is he coming to solve? Eternal death. Eternal separation from God. So what is coming to solve? And Nicodemus is being told here, the same, same way it happened, the same, same way it will, it, it will happen. So, just like you could not give money to the serpent to get healed, he's being told that the son of man will be lifted up. And then the structures are given in verse 15. Uh, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, believing and looking, they have been brought at the same level. You see that? Yeah. So, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if you know that the offer here now is universal, why is this happening? For God so loved the world. For God. Because it happened in Israel and now the Son of Man has come. He's being lifted up. Why is he being lifted up? Because God loves the whole world. This is the flow. Now if God loves the whole world, why do you just love your church a lot? Why? Some, some of us don't even love our church. We walk to church we see, we check if the seat is dusty or not. We sit on it. We say amen. Uh, tell them. Amen. Go deeper. Then uh, give your offering. Then you walk back home. And you say you like your church. That's not liking your church. Liking your church is allowing your spiritual gift to have an impact to fellow believers. It can only happen through interactions. It can only happen when you minister. It can only happen when what you have is failed by other people around you. In Christ Jesus was life, and his life has become the light of man. You see that? So we look at him and we live. Amen? We believe in him and we live. He said, because I live, you also will live. So Jesus is explaining that. And he says, it is similar. These are similar things. They are similar things. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But we are just looking at the love of God is universal. So your field, your field is also universal. Did you hear that? You are not confined to any geographical area. You have the whole world to preach the gospel. Of the whole world. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So there is everyone, everyone, this is the sign, everyone. Our mission is international. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself. Amen? Yeah, don't limit yourself. As you begin with Jerusalem, at least get some passport. Amen? Eh? Yeah, you never know. You never know you are Samaria. You never know you are Judea. You never know your ends of the world. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. So everyone who hears the gospel, the only positive response is to believe. To believe on Christ Jesus. This is the most important question in the world. The most important question of time is that, Sirs, what must I do to be? Yeah. The most important question in, in in time. So if that's the most important question, then the answer must be also the most important answer. And the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Uh, this is an, an addendum of you and your household is because this was a man and it was assumed that he's the leader of the family and the moment he gets uh, saved, then he lead all his the entire family to Christ Jesus. It's a perfect home. It's, a, it's looking at a perfect home. But the most important answer that we need always to have on the forefront of our thinking is not come to our church. No, that doesn't save. Although it's, it's obvious, you don't give birth to children and throw them on the street. You need to take them a place they'll be nursed. So come to our church is good, but after they have believed. Yeah? It's not say after me. Because a child, if, imagine going to hospital and your wife is telling you, he's a baby boy. And you're telling the boy, call me daddy. Call me daddy. That's what you tell sinners. If you want to be born again, say, God is my father, devil, I've left you, I've followed Jesus, you have done what? You are forcing a newly born baby to, to talk. That prayer. Because it's not even their prayer. You are saying, say after me. They are saying your words. But the issue is to believe. So do, they, do you think they believe the words they are saying? Believe the word of Jesus Christ. So many things that we take people, every eye closed and every hand, every, it's not important. Every hand bowed, everything. It's not even walking to the aisle. It's not. It doesn't help that come in the front. It's not coming in the front. And most of you, before you knew the truth, you went in the front a few times. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you said after a pastor a few times. If you liked going to crusades, you, you were born again in many enough crusades. This one, ay, this one is more convincing. Uni muzungu toka US wounded leo ndakoka na eh. Mnajere na kuja nasema godo, nasema hii ndio hiyo. The most important place we are taking people is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to give them the content that they need to believe in. Need to be according to the scriptures. Eh? Need to give them the content. But the response is always the positive response is to believe. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive a mission of sin. You see, this is what the apostles preach. The apostle preached, believe on Christ Jesus. Since it was a repeat after me. Imagine when Peter was preaching at the Great Jerusalem Crusade and 3,000 people say they have to say after Peter. Maybe one by If he has to lay his hands on them. If they have promised to join his church. If they have to sign commitment cards. Commitment cards are wapi amimuni. All these things are nonsense. They, 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 it's, it's false security. He's saying in, 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 uh, in uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse, uh, is it verse 10? Let's just, I don't want to teach that scripture, but let's briefly look at it, just briefly. Let's begin from verse 8. Romans 10 from, from verse 8. <laughs> I know there are scriptures about chapter 10 you know very well. Okay, verse 1 to 4, verse 1 to 4. Just quickly. 
as one to four. Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel. 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 Is that they may be. So Israel is not saved. Eh? For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But not according to. You cannot kill all those animals unless you have zeal. You cannot give tithe unless you have zeal. Fast fruits. Atonement. You cannot do that unless you have zeal. But all this was without knowledge. For they, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. You see this? They are ignorant of God's righteousness. And seeking to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. It's a continuation of that story. So let's go to verse 8. So verse 8, but what does it say? Look at it. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of are we there? The word of faith which we preach. So that's what Paul is saying. The word of faith. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and, and do what? Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be... So, confess may, may bring a problem here, Kidogo. I look at verse 10, it will clarify that. For with the heart, one believes and two, you believe in the heart, and once you have believed in the heart, you become righteous. Okay? And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation then we need to understand which kind of salvation are we talking about. Because the word salvation does not always, does not always mean to remove someone from hell to heaven. Okay. <laughs> uh, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. This one is talking about the eternal shame. Eternal separation from God into uh, hell. Whoever believes shall not be put to shame. To confess. The word confess is a Greek word homo logeo. Homo logeo. Don't worry about that. We, maybe we'll learn it better at that time. So homo logeo. Homo logeo means to agree with someone. Okay. To agree with someone. Or to say the same thing as the other. To say the same thing as the other. So agree with someone or say the same thing as the other. So if I come and tell you Jesus Christ is Lord and you agree with me that Christ is Lord, what have you done? You have confessed. You have whole more <laughs> God. That's why in 1 John chapter 2 verse 9, if you commit a sin, the Bible just say homologeo. Agree that what I've done is sin. You say the same thing. That which God is calling sin you also call it sin. You have agreed with God. You are acknowledging. Saying the same thing as. Okay? So if you took that here, uh, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord just and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We just learned earlier that he was raised up on the cross for our sins, transgressions, and he was raised up from among the dead for our justification. So, they are being told here, if you believe that God raised him from among the dead, you are justified. There's no doctrinal contradiction here. You are justified. And then, look at it. So, confess here, if you use the homologeo, saying the same thing that you have learned now, because for so long, you have said Caesar is Lord. For so long, you have never believed that that man who died on the cross in Jerusalem has the power to save you. That is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he is God. You have never believed like that. Now today, if you have learned it, you have understood it, you have believed it, and you can say the same thing, you can agree with what you have learned. Homologeo. Homologeo means that just to acknowledge, to say the same thing, 
or to agree with someone. To agree with the other. And that's what Paul is teaching in this place. He's saying, if you agree with what I'm telling you, and how will he know that you have agreed? Is to speak it out. But now look at where he is. He's addressing the Jewish people, the very people, uh, the, the, the structure, the construction of the book of Romans is that Paul teaches the doctrine of salvation up to chapter 8. Then chapter 9, 10, and 11, he now addresses the Jewish people for their rejection of Christ Jesus. Then he comes to chapter 12, now he brings the practical aspect of our salvation. You get it? So the doctrine of salvation is from chapter 1 to chapter 8. Chapter 9, 10, and 11, he's addressing the nation of Israel and their rejection for Christ Jesus and what has become of them for rejecting Christ Jesus. And therefore he's telling them, instead of you establishing your own righteousness, saying that you will subject yourself to Moses, the law of Moses, you will continue sacrificing in the temple, why don't you just hear that this man is the Lord and agree with me, say the same thing, acknowledge it. Then now, if you acknowledge it, you need to understand that it is with the heart that one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. This must be second ten salvation. That which you have believed in, now don't just hide it. Work it out. Speak it out. Speak it out. Make sense? So, to him all the prophets witnesses that through his name, whoever believes. This is the most important thing in the gospel. You need to present the gospel with clarity that those who hear you, they need to understand and do what? Believe. There are so many complications when we are presenting the gospel are not important. They make you look like you know so much, that you are so learned, you can use tough words, you can do what, but you are not getting the results. So why do things that are not giving you results? Present the gospel. Uh, 2 Corinthians yeah, uh, 11. Verse 3. You need to present the gospel with simplicity. Look at what the apostle says. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your mind may be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? In Christ. Jesus is not so complicated. You may know a few word, complicated words here, but don't be so complicated for people. Look at verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you received a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Look at verse 10. Paul says, As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Verse 11, why? Because I do not love you, God knows. Verse 12, but what I do, I will continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. Paul is saying the importance of continually constantly, consistently teaching the truth is that you cut off the opportunity of those who come to pervert the gospel. You cut off. Yeah? Some of you, <laughs> men and women have worked very hard to cut off some men who used to come and pervert the gospel in your life. And they have succeeded, some we have not. Paul says, I will continue doing what I do. I will continue teaching the gospel. Keep teaching. So that you cut off those who think they have an opportunity to come and emulate his life, we must cut off them off. They need to be cut off. And the only way we can do that is the gospel. So that people can understand with clarity and simplicity what Christ is all about. So look at this. Look at this. Th those people who, who, want, who want to come and uh, pervert the gospel in your life, Paul says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into I don't think there is any title in this world that has been misused more than this. <laughs> the Bible says, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into... You know, when you dream about a black cow and you think that was Satan, no. <laughs> Satan comes like an angel of light. He must come to entice you. He doesn't want to threaten you. 
You will know. And sometimes he comes on two feet. An angel of light. Aya. Therefore, it's no great thing if these ministers, I want you to look at this verse 15 clearly because that's where we are. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers, whose ministers? Oh, so Satan has ministers. The book of Acts says, and Moses also has his ministers. <laughs> and now Satan also has his ministers. So, therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of what? Whose end will be according to their works. They transform themselves. They want to talk about the gospel of righteousness. If there is an easy place that Satan can hide himself, it's in the gospel of grace. He can find a home. Because you know, don't judge people. So there is simplicity in Christ Jesus. Have you seen that? The gospel needs to be presented in simplicity. We say doctrinal clarity and simplicity in speech. The gospel needs two things, doctrinal clarity and simplicity in speech. Doctrine, you are so clear, you are firm, but speech is so simple. The negative response to the message of the gospel is to reject Christ Jesus as your Savior. So, when the gospel message is presented, there are only two responses. When someone tells you, let me think about it, he's saying, I have rejected Christ. You know, there are people who think that they, they are the ones who, who decide. So they say, let me think about it. Give me time. It's just simply telling you, I have rejected the message. Because the message can only be believed or rejected. That's why we say we have two responses, positive and negative. Negative is rejection of the gospel. Positive is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have, we have some of them here. Thank God for Christ. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God did not send his son. Why do you think this verse says God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world? Jesus comes to the world that is condemned through Adam. Every single human being comes in the world condemned. Separated from God. Destined for hell. Every single human being. So, I normally say, you cannot go to the mortuary to kill people. If you are going to the mortuary to do some ministry, it is to give life. <laughs> Not to kill. Because the people in the mortuary are already dead. You see? So Christ comes to the world that is already condemned in Adam. That's why he comes to save, not to condemn. You, you may never know the impact of what we are doing right now in your life. But this deliverance, as Mama is saying. So, Jesus did not come in the world to condemn. And even right now, Jesus has no ministry of condemnation. Do you know that? He has given more grace. That, that's why the Bible says in um, uh, Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 19, where sin abounded, grace abounded, much more. Why? Is it because God approves sin? No. So that there is enough opportunity for every sinner to get born again. So the grace of God is abounding much more. You can think it's an approval for sin, but God is doing everything possible to draw the sinner to himself. And that's why his grace is far beyond every sin of man. They say it reaches to the ends of the world it goes to the highest place and to the deepest of valleys. The highest of mountains and deepest of valleys. Because God does not want everybody to miss out on something. His desire is that everybody may, may get saved. His desire. But again, you must respond. You must cooperate with the grace of God. Everybody comes to the world separated from God and destined for hell. Ata ni mzungu. You know, you Africans, we think that white men come saved. And I can't go to our cook. I look at the man in Adam. When I was demonstrating to women, I just asked them, why do young children that you are feeding bite your breasts? Then I can say, why do you have Adam in the children? So everybody comes in the world condemned. Everybody grows up condemned. 
akingojea wewe umhubirie ndio aokoke unaona kazi mingi uko nayo mm, that's why god is preparing you anangojea wewe umhubirie ndio aokoke so for god did not send his son into the world to be condemned and this is a deep doctrinal statement you need to know those people who are talking about yesu mungu atakupiga atafanya nini yesu atakuonyesha waambie bible i say evil bible i say evil kama si yesu wangu natumikia wewe mtumikie tu lakini baba hajasema nikikukosea naye atanipiga eh wewe tusameane tu hapa tufanye mambo yetu no people people like using jesus as, as their whip but that the world through him might so this is the ministry of Christ Jesus that the world through Christ Jesus may be that's his ministry this is ministry then says he who believes in him is not condemned now here is where we have the two responses to the gospel look at it he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe in him is condemned already have you seen that is condemned because how is he condemned already now you can explain everybody comes to the world with the nature of Adam under condemnation destined for hell that's why Jesus comes to the world to save so because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God so here we have he who believes and he who does not believe and let me tell you the truth everywhere you go in the world we only have these two people in the world he who, be, who he has believed and he who does not believe everywhere we only have those and uh, this is a simple way to look at it everybody in the world positionally either he is in adam or in christ hakuna mtu ati ako hapo adam na christ ama i'm i'm thinking about it huyu hakuna ako tu adam Najua ile siku karibu niokoke. Hakuna kitu kama hiyo. <laughs> I almost got born again. Uh -uh. Either you are in Adam or in Christ. In Adam you are destined for hell. In Christ you are destined for heaven. Evil too. There's no middle ground. And it's a choice everybody makes. So the gospel has only two responses believe or reject now as students of the bible if someone asked you why will men go to hell what would be your answer because they have rejected they have refused to believe in christ not because they were witches not because they were prostitutes no every sin every sin was judged on the cross people are not going to hell because they commit sin yes personal sins have consequences in our life but people are not going to hell because they have committed practical sins people are going to hell because they have rejected Christ Jesus he is the central person of the universe that's something that the most people don't get it completely and mostly evangelists when they stand on the evangelistic pulpit they say we we malaya unaenda kuzimu sijui eh nani there's no gospel like that the gospel is simple that Christ died on the cross paid the sins of the whole world not because you are good people but because God loves you and God has told you if you believe in Christ Jesus you will never perish you will have eternal life and therefore if you don't believe in him you have rejected him you are condemned and you are going to hell not because you have committed sin but you are already condemned in Adam that's why the scripture says if any man be in Christ is a new creation ah, all the things have passed away whatever you used to be in Adam now has passed away you have been translocated transplanted from the seedbed into the you are no longer you, you are we are all born in Adam then you hear the gospel you believe you are uprooted from adam you transferred and placed in christ so if any man be in christ is a position it's a position just like right now we are in the church here it's a position that's why the church is called the body of christ so you enter that body of christ if any man is 
in Christ. It's a position. We need to put it at the forefront of our thinking. Don't judge people because of what they do. Present the gospel to them. The gospel has the power to rescue them from being in Adam, transfer them in Christ Jesus, and transform them while they're in Christ Jesus. You see that? Transformation does not happen when you are in Adam. When you go to fish, you dive in the water and you are fishing. Then you see a very nice fish. You start washing it from inside the, fish, the, the sea. You remove the intestine throughout, do everything, prepare it from inside. The, or you, the most important thing is to remove it from the water first. That's the most important thing. If you find an expectant woman drinking a lot, a lot of water, you ask her, what are you doing? I'm washing my baby. <laughs> can, 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 can you wash the baby in the womb? What should happen? It doesn't matter how the baby comes looking like. Some baby comes looking like, like this, that has a different difference. But the most important thing is the baby to be born. After the baby is born, now the work of transformation begins. Most of us, we want to wash the baby from the womb. And that's why when we, we, we go to the crusade today, people stop sinning. What are you doing at that time? Washing the baby in the womb. Wacha pombe kuja kwa yesu. Wacha usharadi kuja kwa yesu. Siku ya kiamari na kungojea. Na kutangazia siku ya leo. And because you have a hoarse voice, you think a hoarse voice means more anointing. In John 3, 36 says, He who believes in the Son has what? And he who does not believe in the Son, why? The wrath of God will come upon him? Abides on him. Remains on him. Remains on him. So we need to understand that everybody is born in Adam, a sinner, destined for hell. The wrath of God is upon every child born. You are the one who is seeing a bundle of joy. God is not seeing a bundle of joy. God is seeing a sinner going to hell. You are the one who is seeing prince, princess. Oh, you are the one who is seeing that. The results of believing. God justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies everyone who believes in Christ Jesus. Salvation and transformation. So God justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies everyone who believes in Christ Jesus. In short, you can call it salvation and transformation. The proclamation of, or declaration of the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. This is the righteousness that only God can provide to those who believe in Christ Jesus alone by faith alone. This righteousness is totally unachievable, unattainable by human efforts or performance. It's not something that you can merit, you can work for. You cannot say, I'll work until I become righteous. I'll, I'll pray until I become righteous. I'm going to give my way into righteousness. I'm going to stay in the church and do everything. Work there and uh, sweep the church and do this until I become righteous. You can do that and still go to hell. You must just believe on Christ Jesus and you will be saved. And that's why the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For in that gospel, the power of God that brings salvation is reveal which this power was first presented to the Jews and now to the Gentiles in the gospel Bible says a righteousness from God is revealed which is from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith that is it, that's the whole gospel so in other words the gospel that does not reveal the righteousness of God is a powerless gospel a gospel that does not reveal the righteousness of God is a powerless gospel. Why? Because everything else can be done without the cross. Everything else. You can go to America if you are not born again. You don't have to be prayed for to get a passport. Jesus does not need to die for you to get a passport to America. You can be the richest person in Kenya without Christ. Is it true? We don't have to go to church and, and do things for us to become rich. No. Just learn some commerce know how to do business, or inherit from your father, or steal. You can be rich. You can be rich minus the cross. Do you agree? Yeah. You can perform miracles minus the cross. 
Look at the Old Testament. Jesus had not died and some of the most powerful miracles are in the Old Testament. Look at Moses. Look at Elisha. Look at Elijah. Powerful miracles. Look at Jonah. I've tried to look, to do, to look at uh, Nargio to see which kind of fish that, that is this that could swallow a man and swim to the shore. And uh, so this righteousness is unachievable by human performance. It can only be given through the gospel. So in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, so you are seeing here that the righteousness of God is unachievable by human acts, not by the works of the law. Even we, when Paul says we, he says we Jewish people have believed in Christ Jesus that we, the Jewish people, might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. When you hear a Jew saying that we have chosen to put Moses aside and believe in Christ Jesus, then you need to believe that serious matter. Yeah? Because salvation is only through faith. The right response to the gospel is through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. These are the things that I underline in my Bible. Look at Galatians 3.22. It says, But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Philippians 3, 7 to 9, But what things were gained to me, this I have counted loss for Christ, yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Are you seeing that? You cannot work for it. You cannot do your own efforts. But look at what Paul is saying. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness. You know, when you observe the law until you reach a level that you think you are righteous, there is something you have done. You can say, this is my own hard work. This is my own efforts. And even those of us who are in grace, you hear people saying, you know, I prayed so much. That's your own. When God is moving in your life, it's not because of what you did. It's because of who God is and what he accomplished for you at the cross. Actually, we, we who understand the gospel should stop bragging about what we are able to do or what we have done and concentrate on what God has done on our behalf. Because even the production of righteousness in your life is God who is doing it through you. He works in us, both to will and to do according to his pleasure. So, boasting about ourselves does not come in at all at all. That's what Paul is saying. Uh, don't worry, we will, uh, when we look at justification, we will go deep in these scriptures. Just mentioning them. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Uh, one thing you should never ever do is to demonize the law. The law was given by God. The law is a reflection of God's righteousness, of God's essence, of God's goodness, of God's justice. That's what the law is reflecting. Let me say something dangerous. The law was an expression of God's grace to the nation of Israel. If God wanted them to behave in a particular way and they didn't know how, he had to give them the law which can confine them so they don't sin so much and that can, they, they keep struggling to see if they can please God. It was an expression of grace. But the manifestation of grace is through Christ Jesus. Now we have an expression of God's grace and the manifestation of grace. You know, let me say this. God is a God of grace from the beginning to the end. He didn't become a God of grace somewhere in the middle in the New Testament. Grace is the nature of God. So let's look at it like this. Let's look at it like this. When the children of Israel were suffering in captivity in Egypt. What did they do for God to come and rescue them from there? How, did they, how much did they pray? And do you know the deliverance of the children of Israel from the Egyptian captivity through the Red Sea 
into the wilderness is a glimpse of God's grace. It's a glimpse of salvation. And just in a, in a, in a nutshell, do you know all the people who were delivered from Egypt, none of them went back? However much they wanted to go back, none of them wanted to go went back. They complained in the wilderness. They admired Egypt, but none of them went back because one saved. So it was a, a, a glimpse of, of, of what God will do with me and you. It was an expression of his grace. He tells them, I carried you on eagle's wings. Eagle's wings, you are F. It was, how much did you do to be carried on eagle's wings? Zero. That's grace. He expresses his grace to the nation of Israel, but now he fully manifests his grace and allows grace to come in the world through Christ Jesus. But grace is just a nature of God. But he was preparing the world just like when you are sick. To say you have pain in your leg and you can now walk and we carry you to hospital. And you sit before a doctor and says, how are you feeling? I have pain in the leg. Okay. Prescription. Go. Will you, will you take that prescription? You want a doctor who will tell you go to the laboratory. Go to x-ray. Let's see the results. Go to MRI. Let's see the results. Then now we have discovered the nerve that is, is hurting you. Now let's heal it. That's what God did with the law of Moses. You think you are good people? Thou shall not. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. He x-rayed them. He showed them the x-ray. They said, we need a savior. So all through, it was a journey. The Bible is one story. From Genesis to Revelation. It's one story. But progressively being revealed in different human dispensations. One story being revealed progressively. Just like right now, the thing we are waiting for is rapture. The great tribulation. It's the same story, but being revealed to different people at different times. In the kingdom. Same story. Same story. There's a man who says, the Bible is simply God searching for a bride for his son. He says that's the bride for his son. That's the whole story of the Bible. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. So we need to know, although the law was the perfect, perfect from God, it was holy, it was a good uh, document, but what made the law weak? The human flesh could not achieve what the law was demanding. We get it. The human flesh has no capacity to serve God, to honor God, to worship God until you become righteous. The human flesh will always let you down. The human flesh response to God fluctuates. Fluctuates. Even now that we know what Christ did on the cross, even if you, you sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. Do you love him every day? Do you love him every moment? It's fluctuating. So if God was to depend on our love for him to love us, our flesh is weak. Even after knowing what Christ had done for us on the cross, we still fluctuate in our response to him. So what weakens the law is the inability for the human flesh to achieve what the law is demanding. That's clear. Eh? So it's not the law that was bad. The law was unachievable. You can put that in your notes. The law is not bad. It was unachievable by the human flesh. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of a sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. Look here. Might be fulfilled where? In us. Who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Don't worry about these scriptures. We'll hear them and hear them again and again. Because for me to tell you the same things and again and again is safe. It's not tedious, but for you, it is safe. So before to think, <laughs> before to think of Romans chapter 5, you will have heard these scriptures enough time. Enough time. It is safe. It is safe. Amen. Praise God. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Grace for Transformation Kenya. Every new subscriber is a great blessing. 
Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It is not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty of all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You will never perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You're welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya. For inquiries, contact the registrar on 0722-898-340.